Hey folks, just like one of my favourite stories, David and Goliath, this is a question that, on paper at least, seems to have a foregone conclusion. It seems like it's a wash and it seems that these two processors shouldn't even occupy the same battleground. It really shouldn't be a question that needs answered, but thanks to rock bottom pricing on used Zen processors, it kinda is. I picked up this used Ryzen 7 1700 on eBay for less than 90 quid a few months back. It was CPU only so no cooler, but even a fully boxed listing can still be had in the low 3 figures mark. That's right, 8 cores, 16 threads, 20 megabytes combined L2 and L3 cache, and an unlocked multiplier on a mainstream platform at entry level prices. Now I love the old 1700, it was my choice of CPU when Ryzen launched back in 2017, and was only really replaced when I bought my 3700X last year. So when AMD released their newest entry level Ryzen 3 CPUs based on the latest Zen 2 architecture, I was a little bit conflicted. You see, in my budget test system, I use an overclocked Ryzen 7 1700. And while as an all-rounder having 16 threads is great, when it comes to gaming, well, it's been thoroughly documented that the Ryzen 7s of yesteryear fell behind Intel's rival at the time, the i7-7700K. And why do I bring up the 7700K? Well, AMD's new Ryzen 3 CPUs, the 3100 and the 3300X, on paper at least, offer performance which rivals Intel's old crown jewel for 99 quid and 190 quid respectively. Now, while both the 3100 and the 3300X feature the same 4-core, 8-thread configuration, there are some key differences. The 3100 uses two active cores across two CCXs, with each CCX having 8 megabytes of L3 cache enabled, for a total of 16 meg. The 3300X, on the other hand, has four cores, eight threads, but with all four active cores on the same CCX within the CCD, along with 16 megs of L3 cache on that CCX. This means that the 3300X will have less core-to-core -core latency, and this fact, along with the unified L3 cache, translates into a bigger performance gap between these two CPUs than the increase in clock speed might suggest. So I've got the 3300X here today, and out of the box we get a 3.8GHz base clock, pretty similar to my overclocked 1700 which is still sitting at 3.9, but while the first gen Ryzen in my test setup is locked at that speed, the 3300X can boost even higher to 4.3GHz under load. So let's pit these two against one another in a variety of games and using a variety of graphics cards to see how one of AMD's cheapest Zen 2 processors compares with the first genuinely affordable true 8 core CPU from 2017, and to see if 4 cores on the latest architecture can hold a candle to the old guard's 8. The system I'll be using for this is based on the ASRock Fatality B450 motherboard, 16GB of DDR4 memory, which is clocked in at 3000MHz when using the Ryzen 7 1700, and can be pushed 3333MHz when using the Ryzen 3 3300X. For graphical horsepower, I'll be using both the Radeon RX 580, potentially still the king of the ring when it comes to cards around the low 100 quid mark, and an RTX 2060 6GB, which in my opinion is one of the better buys if you can find it below 200 quid. So let's kick things off with the Rise of the Tomb Raider, a game which caused Ryzen CPUs a few issues at launch due to poor optimization. Things have improved now though, but it's still a game that likes frequency, and the 4.3GHz boost on the Zen 2 CPU helps push the average frame rates 4% higher when using the 580, and 10% higher when using something more potent like the 2060. Percentile lows also see a bump, with both the RX 580 and 2060 seeing around an 8-9% to boost compared to my overclocked Ryzen 7 1700. Shadow of the Tomb Raider now, and it's a similar story again. The RX 580 sees a 1 FPS jump in average FPS, and just under 5% boost in percentile lows, a decent showing for the 580 here, but it is showing that the first gen Ryzen is getting almost all of the performance available out of it. With the RTX card though, the gap widens, and the more powerful RTX 2060 sees a 9% boost to the average frame rate, and a larger 16% boost to the percentile lows when using the 3300X. 
Of course, here we're still very much CPU bound when we're using the 2060 on only the high setting at 1080p, so let's add RTX into the mix. With RTX turned on, the story changes somewhat, and when you're 100% GPU bound, there's absolutely no difference between the 3300X and the 1700, in this title at least. Metro Exodus now and here, with both the 580 and 2060, we see a small jump in average FPS by around 4-5%, and the minimums too get a nice bump by around 8% on the 2060, and 5% again on the 580. Nothing startling for sure, but a repeatable and measurable increase nonetheless. A new inclusion that I've been playing through lately is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And here it's the same story, small percentage increases on both cards, with a 6% boost to the percentile lows in the RX 580, and a 7% boost to the average frame rate on the RTX 2060, being the most noteworthy improvements. Finally, Far Cry New Dawn, and here is a similar story to what we've seen with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The RX 580 gets a small increase with a boost in average frame rate by around 4%, while the percentile lows increase by a solitary frame. The RTX 2060, however, is allowed to flex its muscles more when using the newer Zen 2 based 3300X with a 13% increase to average frame rates and a 9% increase to the percentile lows. Now when looking at all these results in aggregate and excluding the RTX results, what we get through these tests is an increase across the board, but with a few caveats. Firstly, the RTX 2060. When changing over to the system using the 3300X, we netted on average an 8.7% increase when looking at the average frame rates, which is pretty impressive. Not as impressive as the increase in percent of loads however, which seen a jump by 9.5%. Now the RX 580 also seen decent increases, just not as impressive as we've seen on the more powerful 2060. When looking at the average frame rate, we've got an average increase of 3.6%, while the increase in percent of lows stood in at 5.3%, which again is really respectable. The thing is though, these tests, especially with the RTX 2060, put less focus on being GPU limited. And to get the whole picture, you've still got to consider those RTX on results, which was a good example of being 100% GPU bound, and in those tests, there was no difference between either processor. But if you really want to boil it down, then yes, a Ryzen 3 3300X is a better gaming CPU than the Ryzen 7 1700, even when that CPU is overclocked. For cards on the lower end of the scale, think your Polaris cards, a GTX 1650 Super, or older mid-range Pascal cards, then there's not going to be a huge deal in it. Productivity, well that's a different story, and obviously 8 Zen 2 threads still pales in comparison to 16 Zen 1 threads, if your application is heavily multi-threaded. And that is still where the 1700 really shines, just like it did in day 1 of launch. The 3300X though is a brilliant CPU, I mean in one fell swoop it's made pretty much all used Intel quad core CPUs completely redundant, as if they weren't already. All the i7-3770Ks, the 4790s and the 6700s going for 3 figures on eBay on a dead platform, well they all just look ridiculous now. The long and the short of it is this though, even over the top Zen 1 CPUs, the 3300X offers up better gaming performance. It's going to be up to you to decide if your individual use case requires more than 8 threads though. But if it's gaming only, then the 3300X is a cracking budget CPU and completely cements up the budget end of the market as being genuinely usable once again. Once again, David has delivered a killer blow. But I'll leave it there for now, thank you very much for watching, remember to like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.